Okay, um, so now we're going to look at how we're going to do sampling and data analysis for food analysis. Right, these are the area that people tend to overdo, but in actuality, this section is the most important part of your data analysis because even if you have the most accurate and precise analytical techniques, if the sampling and the sample preparation is not done correctly, your data is rendered useless. Okay, so now we're going to look an overview of how you can perform sampling on different situation and basic data analysis in food. Okay, in um, in analyzing uh, properties of food materials, for it to be successful, it depends on different step. The steps that people tend to overlook is actually the most important step is the planning. This is where you um, look at your sample plan. Okay, so what would be this one depends on what would be the objective or purpose of your um, analysis. And from here, you can also identify what are the most appropriate analytical procedures depending on your food metrics okay, and the objective that we see just now. After you have set a good sampling plan, you, what you want to do next is to select your sample okay, from the populations of your food material that you want to analyze. Okay, there are several techniques of how you can select your sample. And afterwards, you need to prepare your sample before you run um, analysis on it. Okay, either you have to uh, extract the specific uh, components of the food in order before you proceed with the analysis, it really depends on the types of analytical tools that you choose. But what's also important in your sample preparation is to make sure that your sample is well preserved, that it still contains the same properties as the properties of your uh, population. And next, once you have done your sample prep, you want to perform your um, analysis. Okay. This one, um, it really depends on what are the, the composition or whatever properties that you want to analyze will decide which techniques that you want to use. And afterwards, um, you may want, you you would need to run a statistical analysis for your data to be acceptable or not. And from here, you can then interpret your data and see if it's achieved the objective that you set early on during your sample planning. Okay, and then lastly, you report the data that you have obtained. So here, just to, to share with you, there are different um, terminology that we use in, um, in food analysis. Okay, when we talk about population, what, do we, what we mean is the overall materials that you want to measure. It could be a truckload of um, milk sample or peanuts. It could be... Um, the whole products in the storage area, okay, that could be your population. Ideally, you want to analyze the whole population, but this is not practical and because it's going to be extremely expensive, um, you're going to need, um, it's going to be labor intensive as well as cost, costly as well, right? So because of that, normally when we do another thing that you have to take into consideration is that the analytical tools that we use are mostly destructive in nature. So you don't want to use the whole material for analysis. So this leads to the next step is where you do your sampling of your sample. So sample is actually just a fraction of your, um, of your population. But what's important when you select your sample, you want to make sure that the properties of your sample is the same as the property of the whole population. In some cases, you may need to take several subsamples to fully represent your whole population. This in particular very important if your sample is not homogeneous, if your population is not homogeneous, they are heterogeneous. But if your sample is, if your uh, population is homogeneous, then it's not really an issue. Okay, lastly, we'll be on the laboratory samples. Once you have performed sampling, you have your sample. Normally, um, if let's say, for example, your population is like 100 kilograms and you perform your sample,
sampling. Per sample is like you take around uh, maybe 500 grams. Okay, that you, you've done some calculation that this one represents your population. It's not possible for you to take the whole sample and analyze. Sometimes when you perform the analytical, uh, this analytical techniques only require a minute amount of that particular sample. But the reason why you do sampling before you get your lab sample is that you want to homogenize your whole sample. So once you homogenize, you make sure all the composition are equally distributed, portion of it, and then you analyze. Okay, you perform the uh, food analysis from this small portion. We call this as sample. Okay, the idea is, as I mentioned, you want to make sure that your sample, the properties of your sample represent the properties of the whole populations. And by performing sampling, it helps a lot as well because it reduces the number of samples that you need to analyze. So this one can be cost effective as at the same time you uh, reduce the labor cost as well. At the same time, you have to also make sure that the number of samples that you have is sufficient for you to perform statistical analysis. Okay, but at the end of the day, you have to also be aware once you have data from your samples, what you have is not an absolute value. What you have is estimation of the value that represent the population. Okay, okay let's go back to the first um, uh, steps, which is the sampling plan. What is sampling plan? It has to be a clearly written document that contains precise detail that analysts use to decide what would be the sample size, the location, where the samples are going to be selected from, what are the methods used to collect the sample, and how are you going to preserve um, analysis. Okay, how you design your sample plan? This one depends on what are the purpose of your analysis, what are the nature of properties to be measured, and the nature of the total population and of the individual, individual samples as well as what are the types of analytical techniques that you want to use to characterize this sample. Some products, they may have um, established or the sampling population has been developed and documented by various organizations. You can also refer to, to this AOAC, okay, but it doesn't cover for the whole different types of um, Okay, first on the purpose of analysis, you have to look at what are the nature of your, um, what are the purpose of your analysis. If it's on the official sample, these are samples that are selected for official or legal requirements by the government laboratories. So in this particular case, what you want, the, sa the samples are analyzed to ensure that manufacturers are supplying safe food that meet legal and labeling requirement. So normally for these types of um, official samples, you need to use official um, techniques, okay, established by this AOAC and so on and so forth. Okay, it can also be, you want to analyze the raw material to make sure that it is of good quality before you produce the food using these raw materials in your factory. And then you also want to see whether this purpose is to, um, to monitor um, the effect of processing on your food composition or food attributes. And you also want to analyze the finished product to make sure that it is safe for consumption and it meets the legal and government regulations. And lastly, for whether you want to analyze for research and development, especially if you are developing new product or you done some improvement to the uh, reformulation of the food. Okay, in terms of the nature of the measured property, we can further divide or classify them into either attributes or vari variable. So attribute means that you are measuring whether this product either have or does not have that certain property. For example, does this food contain pieces of glass or not? or is this food spoiled by microorganisms or not? Okay, so it's a yes or no. In this particular case, normally you need a larger sample size. Whereas for variable, these are the types of, um, this is where you measure properties uh, on a continuous scale. For example, the weight of your sample, what are the uh, effect of certain processing on the fat content, 
or the moisture content of the material. So for variable samples, normally you will require less samples compared to attributes. So next, you have to look at the nature of the population. You want to know whether your sample is finite or infinite, whether they are continuous or compartmentalized. Like for example, um, boxes of potatoes, uh, potato chips or bottles of tomato ketchup. Moving along a conveyor belt means that the population is compartmentalized. Continuous means that there's no physical separation um, in different parts of the sample. Okay, you also want to know whether your population is homogeneous or heterogeneous, as I mentioned before. Best case scenario if the sample population uh, is the population is homogeneous, but in most cases, majority of food they are heterogeneous in nature. So this will also affect your sampling plan. So you, once you have look at the nature of the of your populations, you also need to look at the nature of your test procedures. Okay, so this the nature of the procedures will determine how you're going to choose your um, sampling plan. For example, um, you need to look into the speed, precision, accuracy, and cost per analysis, and you also need to decide whether the you have to consider whether the techniques that you use are destructive or non-destructive in nature. Ideally, what you want for analytical te techniques, as I mentioned before, is you want it to be rapid, low cost, non-destructive and accurate measurement. Okay, but this is the ideal situation. In most cases, you're not able to achieve all these um, properties. This is how you're going to develop your sample plan. Things is you need to, what's going to affect your sample size, it really depends on whether you expected variation in properties within the population. There is any seriousness of the outcome if a bad sample is not detected. This is in particularly important if you are measuring mycotoxin in your raw material. Okay? Because mycotoxin are toxins produced by fungi. They are um, highly carcinogenic, can cause harmful effect to human health upon consuming minute amount. But then, uh, because it's produced by um, fungi, it's not going to be well distributed in your food. So how you select your sample size um, is going to be um, cr critical in this case. Okay, For example, you have a truckload of peanut. Uh, the idea is you're not going to only collect the surface of the truck for your sampling. You have to dig deeper, at least into the center of the truck, okay, uh, for you to do your sam a sampling of your samples because these are the conditions in favor for the um, production of mycotoxin by fungi. Okay, you also need to look at the cost of analysis, whether you have budget to um, to uh, to analyze that many samples. Okay, um, and then this also depends on the analytical techniques that you use. Um, overall, if you talk about um, looking at the variable, okay, uh, variable attributes. Uh, no, sorry, uh, you're looking at variables, uh, nature of your um, food properties. Okay, perhaps you may use less. Normally, we use around three to four samples, but it really depends if you talk about um, performing textural analysis. Okay, you may need to uh, measure more than six samples. I think uh, you need more than six replicates at least eight replicates for your data to be statistically sound. All right. In some cases where you have impractically large sample size, what you can do is you can apply the sequential sampling. Okay. Um, sequential sampling means that you keep on examining your subsamples of the population okay, until you reach a statistically significant result. Okay, you start with small sample and you try to make inference. So you keep on adding samples until you can make clear-cut inference whether you want to reject or accept your sample. Okay, in most cases, you can use statistical techniques to create a sampling plan with minimum number of sub-samples that you need to accurately represent the population. Next, you also want to decide the location of where you're going to do your sample, uh, your sampling, where you're going to collect your sample. If it's homogeneous, it's not really an issue, but if it's heterogeneous, then you need to decide 
what are the sampling methods that you're going to choose. Here, I just give you an example of three sampling methods. It can be random. This is the most favorable um, methods because it avoids human bias and it helps in the application of statistics. You can also have systematic sampling where you draw on the sample systematically with location or time. Example given here is to pick samples after every three tomatoes. Okay, and it can also be judgment sampling where it depends on the judgment of the analyst with experience um, performing analysis of these types of food and the objective for this particular analysis. Problem with this judgment sampling is that it cannot apply statistical analysis as it doesn't represent good uh, representation of the population. Okay, the way sample is collected also need to be clearly specified in your sampling plan. It can either be done manually or um, through mechanical sampling device. So once you have your sample ready, what you want to do next is to prepare your sample sufficiently as your laboratory sample. So one thing is the most important part is to make your sample heterogeneous. Okay, so how you can do that is by homogenization. The way you homogenize samples can be achieved either by chemical device through enzymatic methods or chemical. So depending on different samples, you may use different techniques in homogenizing your sample. If it's semi-solid, then you may want to grade, chop, or blend your sample. If, it, if you talk about soft food, then you may want to mix them in a blend at high speed. Again, this depends on what are the, the compound or component that you want to analyze. If you want to look at the antioxidant, then this blending methods may not be suitable because it um, incur heat and heat can destroy some of the antioxidant properties and activities. Okay, if it's liquid, we talk about uh, soft drinks, what you want to do is to remove any gas from the drinks. Okay, if it's viscous liquid like honey, you want to stir gently with glass rod before you perform your sampling. If it's oil and it's cloudy or crystallized, what you can do is to heat them in order to dissolve and filter this oil while it's still hot. But if it's clear, then you just need to stir it slowly several times before you perform the sampling. But be careful when you handle with oil because they are easily oxidized. So you may have to make sure that the techniques of your homogenization doesn't cause oxidation to your oil. And for sample like fat emulsion, like butter and margarine, what you can do is you can heat the jar neatly okay, at temperature around 60 to 70 degrees Celsius until this fat emulsion melt. And then you stir it and take your representative sample from the top layer of the clear top of the clear layer. So now you can you also need to reduce your homogenized sample into your laboratory samples. So one of the most popular method is to use these quartering techniques. So example ground beef here, originally in your sample you have 50 gram. What you do is you homogenize by mix them properly and you divide into four quadrant. You discard the opposite quadrant and you combine this. So now what you have is half of the original sample. Okay, and you repeat this process until you get up to maybe five to five, five to six grams of your sample sufficient for the lab um, analysis. And sometimes when you perform analysis, you aren't able to perform on the same day as you um, obtain the sample. This is because of the nature of the experiment itself. It may take several days for the sample prep. So what's important is that you want to preserve your sample, you don't want to have any changes happen to your sample because you want it to, when you get the result, it still represent the properties of the original um, population. So one way in preventing food from becoming spoiled is by inactivating the enzyme. This can be achieved by freezing, by heat treatment, or any chemical preservation. You can, for most of the lipid, um, samples with high unsaturated lipid content, you want to protect it from um, being oxidized by storing them in nitrogen or some other inert gas, keep them in a dark room and or cover the bottle as well as keep them in the refrigerated temperature.
and then for microbiological growth and contamination if you want to prevent from um, this happening what you can do is you can freeze or dry or put some heat treatment to your sample okay or any chemical preservation to control the growth of microbes in your food and lastly uh, on physical changes you can further minimize by controlling the temperature of the sample and forces that you that these samples experience and of course it's very important as well to identify your sample you need to describe what are the samples when the sample was taken the location and the person who took the sample as well as method that you use for the uh, use to select the sample this has to be written down in detail in a notebook and must be coded as well so that any personnel can refer back to the to the methods and identify which of these results represent um, which particular sample